Good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Netzer, inaugural Robert L. and Judith T. Winston Director of the McMullen Museum and Professor of Art History in the Department of Art, Art History and Film at Boston College. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this evening's lecture, which accompanies our current exhibition, Martin Parr, Time and Place, curated by Boston College Professor of Photography, Carl Baden, in collaboration with faculty from the Art, Art History and Film, Irish Studies and English departments. The exhibition is the first in the United States to explore Martin Parr's polymathic visionary career as photographer, collector and chronicler of the history of photography. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Martin Parr and his studio once again for their generous loans and enthusiasm for the project. And I wanna thank Rachel Chamberlain, the McMullins Manager of Education, Outreach and Digital Resources for organizing this program. For those of you who have visited the exhibition, you will have noted that the photographs forming the core of the exhibition come from Parr's series documenting life in Ireland over the past five decades. Prior to their inclusion in this exhibition, these images accompanied by Parr's publication entitled From the Pope to the Flat White comprised an exhibition organized by Tracy Marshall Grant that traveled to three venues in Limerick, Roscommon and Dublin. Our three speakers this evening, all members of Boston College's Irish Studies faculty, Marjorie Howes, Vera Kreilkamp, and Joe Nugent, will focus on those images. Each of our presenters is a world renowned scholar of Irish literature. Speaking first will be Vera Kreilkamp, co editor of the journal. Air Ireland and author of the book, The Anglo-Irish Novel and the Big House. Professor Kreilkamp has co-curated and served as editor for the catalogs of five of the McMullen's exhibitions featuring Irish art, most recently, the arts and crafts movement, Making It Irish. Marjorie Howes will follow. A specialist in 19th and 20th century Irish literature, she's well known for her book, Yeats's Nations, Gender, Class, and Irishness, and other publications on W.B. Yeats, as well as her book, Colonial Crossings, Figures in Irish Literary History. Next will be Professor Joe Nugent, who has published widely, both in print and digital format, on James Joyce and Flann O'Brien. His iPhone app, Joyce Ways, and his ebook, digital Dubliners have added new dimensions to the study of James Joyce. This evening, our speakers will share the narrative they crafted for the exhibition's display and interpretation in wall texts and labels of Martin Parr's photographs of Ireland. They'll speak for about 50 minutes and then take questions. If you have a question while they're speaking, you can write it to me in the Q&A. And now I ask you to join me in welcoming our speakers as they take over the screen. Good evening, this is Vera Kralkamp. Um, as Nancy just told you, the group of more than 80 photographs um, that Marjorie, Joe, and I will be discussing this afternoon form the core of what I understand is the largest ever exhibition of Martin Parr's work. These images track this major British photographer's documentary and artistic representations of how Ireland transformed itself over 40 years from an inward looking, socially conservative and deeply observant Catholic nation to a cosmopolitan and an extraordinarily liberal um, one, finally legalizing divorce in 1995, gay marriage in 2015, and most recently in 2018, a woman's right to abortion. 
The 40 year period par documents from the late 1970s to 2019. So rapid changes on many fronts on the island, economically and politically, but socially and culturally too. As the photographs track how the Irish entertained themselves, shopped and built their houses. During these four decades, uneven periods of increasing prosperity eventually brought economic opportunity, modern conveniences, and a higher standard of living. But they also ushered in growing awareness of economic and gender inequality and the declining authority of the church. And huge numbers of Irish men and women um, continued to emigrate to the US, Britain, Australia, and Canada for many of these years. But in 1972, just half a dozen years before Parr began photographing in Ireland, 83% of the country's voters, most overwhelmingly in traditional rural areas we see in his early black and white photos, voted to join the European Economic Community. That's arguably the most significant, significant decision the country made since independence. And according to Fintan O'Toole's new book, We Don't Know Ourselves, it's gonna be launched here next month in BC. This partnership with Europe became the moment at which an economically shaky Ireland officially became a Western country at last, part of the developed and democratic world. Social more is shifted dramatically and the authority of the Catholic church declined with the revelations of abuse in church-run institutions. Additionally, the 30 years of violence associated with the troubles in Northern Ireland that led to the deaths of thousands abated after the 1998 Good Friday Peace Accord, a bit more than a decade after Parr began photographing on the island. So again, Parr's Irish photographs offer a sustained engagement with rapid accelerating change. The early black and white photos of fair days, rural leisure activities, or Catholic worship are far from cliched nostalgic tourist images of a traditional Ireland. Although they have an authentic documentary quality depicting a disappearing world, they are always surprising humorous, enigmatic, or mysterious. His scenes are candid rather than posed, frequently emphasizing the act of looking for both the photographer and for subjects within the image. Some photos then capture moments of layered spectatorship in which the camera watches those who are watching something else, while in others, people or even animals, as with this wonderful image before you, break the frame by looking directly at the camera, those sheep. Parr offers the viewer ordinary life and local culture in Ireland, but composes these images in unexpected ways that call attention to the deliberate artfulness and humor of his work. And the first section I'll be talking about, we organized, the images and sections, the Irish studies faculty. The first section is called Fair Days. And selling livestock provided a major source of income for farm families. And Parr's early photos capture the fairs and cattle markets that had long been an integral part of life in towns and rural areas. Although expressions of Parr's early mastery of documentary photography, these images are also commentary, capturing layered aspects of the traditional life he record, recorded. The photos at Fair Day convey this diversity by adapting an array of unusual and shifting uh, perspectives, as in this eerie, almost Gothic image Parr took at a Galway Fair known for the sale of Connemara ponies. Um, it's, it's disoriented. The next image is um, called Ken Mayer, is from the Ken Mayer Fair area. Okay, and that's by the way, it's on this is on the scenic ring of Kerry. Many tourists will know this area. This photo's narrative 
complex composition might disrupt an outsider's conventional views of tradition and modernity in rural life towards the end of the 20th century. Notice the three-part division, a dog on the left, then two boys confined inside the phone booth, probably escaping, um, sheltering from the rain, and the contrast of cows roaming freely through the side, town sidewalks and streets to the, those living or traveling around rural Ireland in the early 1980s, as I did, I traveled then, saw this, such scenes of people driving livestock through the streets and stopping all traffic would be read as documents of ordinary life. And the town's phone booth that dominates dominates the center of the image, might signal something modern next to the wandering cows. But despite the availability of phone service for most people in the early 1980s, this booth has pro had probably been there for half a century as a center of rural communication with immigrant relatives abroad or messaging more locally. When Parr arrived with his wife or his girlfriend, then wife, in 1979, he reports that he couldn't get a phone line himself. So that these have been there for a long time. In the back of the image, above the cattle, a dual Irish-English uh, road sign to Bantry signals the important role of Irish, the country's official first language that is taught in virtually all schools and still appears not only on road signage, but even on the walls of many supermarkets today. So we have a genuinely documentary photo that may strike strangers to Ireland as truly weird for the later day, for the you know, last decades of the 20th century. All right, next. This is the one you saw before, um, the sheep staring at us as well as their seemingly careful arrangement. Of course, they weren't arranged, they were not posed, but they were shot at this moment in a roughly descending order of size across the horizontal axis of the image, they comically upstage and maybe sardonically comment on the animated interaction between two men compared to that very dark and gothic looking one I showed you before, Mom, Mom Cross Fair. This photo is more humorous and darkly eerie, but the viewer also sees the sheep confined and lined up for sale, vulnerable witnesses to a conversation that will determine their fate. And the next one, um, as often in Parle's Parle's work, this, cat, this is a cattle auction, of course. The presumed central focus within this scene, here the cattle for sale, is only visible. I mean, these are the cattle's haunches we see from the camera's vantage point. What, what strikes me is the exclusively male presence at this cattle auction, suggesting the dearth of female participants in a key ritual of economic transaction in rural Ireland. The auctioneer gestures um, and, and with authority supported by the official in the trench coat and watched by a crowd of eager, eager male customers. So again, in this lively and crowded photo, Tom Parr is documenting how this busy center of rural economic activity excluded uh, women. Many men owned farms, very few women at the time. Um, this section we, we titled Religion in Action. In 1979, one million celebrants awaited Pope John Paul II's descent by helicopter, as if from heaven, for a mass at Phoenix Park, Dublin. One witness commented, the tone almost everywhere on the streets, in the media, was one of utter reverence. Catholic Ireland seemed invulnerable impervious to change or challenge. Significantly, in his images about religion, Parr photographs Irish Catholic devotion at outdoor sites rather than inside the country's churches, 
a choice perhaps implying the vast spiritual and moral authority that Catholicism ex exercised over the entire landscape 40 years ago when fully two thirds of the nation's population attended the Pope's several masses on the island. On the island. Yet with a seemingly prescient anticipation of coming social change, John Paul, although praising Ireland's religiosity, warned against threats to Catholic piety, and specifically against the modern consumerism and changing moral codes that Parr's later photos will amplify. Um, and I'm going to go on a little more about this one. In this image of the Dublin Mass, Parr fo focuses not on the charismatic figure of John Paul, and that was on his, the first ever papal visit to Ireland, not on John Paul, but on the eager expectations of the worshipers. With bowed heads and silent awe, their bodies and shadows are spilling down a slope as they move towards the site of the Pope's arrival in his red helicopter. The crowd seems endless, stretching back towards a vanishing point on the horizon. Significantly, this image of a nation's religious devotion includes many women whose roles in our society had long been shaped by ideals of chastity and maternity, modeled by the Virgin Mary. The next image is St. Mary's Holy Well in County Leitrim. For centuries, more than 3,000 holy wells in Ireland served as places of Christian worship. But St. Mary's received, restored by locals in the 19th century is reportedly the only one dedicated solely to the Blessed Virgin. Its existence can be traced to pre-Christian sacred springs, again suggesting the enduring connection in Ireland between landscape and spirituality. But Parr's sometimes sardonic eye signals the site's shifting temporalities through the plastic cup deposited next to the traditional statue of Mary. Postulants for intercession from her, a mother with a child and a traditionally dressed rural man appear set back from the Virgin by the diagonal um, angles of the tree chomp tree trunk or water pipe. Cropatric, this is in Mayo. On the last Sunday of July, about 50,000 people climb Cropatric for Ireland's most important pilgrimage. The angles of this photograph accentuate the stony slope of the mountain on which St. Patrick, according to tradition, fasted and prayed for 40 days in 441 AD. Parr's composition signals his humorous play with modern and traditional devotional practices. Here through the plastic shopping bag uh, in one figure's hand, rather than the stone that a medieval pilgrim would carry to place on a cairn on the summit. And although serious Christian penitents climbed Pro Patrick with bloody bare, bloody bare feet, their well-equipped 20th century counterparts appear to have shed that requirement. Today, the climb is also advertised on the web as a rite of passage for hiking enthusiasts in Ireland. Okay. Good evening. This section is called A Day Out. Parr was particularly interested in what Irish people did with their leisure time. Uh, watching horse races, going swimming, going to pubs, playing traditional music. And he was very alert to how these activities changed over time. And we'll see that in some of the later sections. He conveys the pleasure and sociability of such activities, but sometimes he also hinted at darker themes like drunkenness or social isolation. This one uh, has a very striking composition. I think everything revolves around the horse in the center. The picture emphasizes spectatorship. We are watching people watch something. The perspective is flattened and the horse's horizontal motion contrasts uh, the stillness and the vertical lines represented by the spectators 
uh, and the wooden pole. Next one. Uh, I actually think this is an ambiguous image. We, we had a bit of a debate among the Irish studies uh, faculty when we were working on this. I find it a little bit disturbing. When I look at this, I imagine the child may be abandoned or waiting for her parents to come out of the pub. I think it's a her anyway. Uh, I think her pose is unsettlingly adult, uh, even slightly uh, sexual, but it's also possible uh, to read this as a much more innocent and benign image of childhood. And that's how some other Irish studies faculty read it. And it gives us a chance to explore how different viewers might take away different interpretations um, of these complex photographs. And I'll be back later, but now um, I'm turning things over to Joe for a while. Thanks very much, Marjorie. Um, hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. Uh, I, I can't claim any particular expertise in the aesthetics of the photography of, um, of, of this exhibition. Uh, I, if I have anything useful to say, it's that I lived through much of this. I grew up in that rural Ireland that's depicted so absolutely beautifully here by Martin Parr. Um, I have uh, drunk in the bars that you've seen here. I attended the Pope's Mass that you saw before. I danced, if that's the word, in these ballrooms that we're going to look at here. In this part of the exhibition that's called show bands and ballrooms, uh, show bands, excuse me, uh, uh, and, and ballrooms, yes. Uh, I, I just want to move away from that for a moment, actually, to something that's not depicted within the exhibition or the exhibition catalogue. And that's a moment in 1994 that happened during the Eurovision Song Contest at the interval when something with which you might be familiar there uh, arose and that was a, a transformative experience in the many people in Ireland who watched it and in, in the spirit of the nation. And I, I don't mean that just metaphorically. And that's the appearance of river dance. River dance, you might know as, 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 as something that's, that's full of energy, is characterized by its exuberance, by even its eroticism. It's about dance and we think of it now, I think, as, as being part of the, of the Irish uh, self that it expresses what we're about more than anything else. So how strange it is then to return to these photographs that you're going to see for their grayness, for their darkness, for their anxiety and whatever. And the explanation for these goes back quite a long time. Uh, rather peculiarly, it, it might seem, in 1935, an Irish government introduced legislation against public dancing. It was quite literally uh, illegal to organize dances publicly, except within particular spheres, one had to apply for a license it meant that dancing was um, it was in the control of the judiciary, of the police and of the clergy. And from then on, dances were held invariably in the parish halls and they would have been policed by the parish priests. Now, we're coming here to 1980 and some changes were happening. Modernization that I suppose could arguably have really hit Ireland in the 1960s with the arrival of television and that uh, produced a new uh, a class of, uh, of mercantiles, I, I guess, say mercantiles, and the, these ballrooms appeared all over the place, fully 800 of them in the course of just 15 years in which, to which young people flocked in search of, well, of what? We'll have a look inside in a moment and it'll give you some ideas. But it is the case that even if these ballrooms were, um, were, were a break from the parish halls that had been before, the ethos remained. And we're looking here at the Mayflower Ballroom. And the first thing we might just wonder, what is a ballroom in the middle of Ireland doing with the title Mayflower? This, this, why is it called after an American ship, if it was of the what, 16th, 15th century, I'm not sure. But you can see there, the, this is the place of, of the, the light, the, the brightness there, the attraction that's there. And these people who have come from afar in their cars and their motor bicycles um, and waiting to, to, to stream in, in the hopes of what? Well, what dancing is always for. It's the beginning of the mating game, I expect. But even straight away, par, leaves us in some sort of doubt. It's the ghostliness of these figures. And we already wonder what is within there, some kind of a demi monde. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll get some glimpse of what the interior perhaps might've been like. And this is three young men preparing themselves for the dance. They're in the bathroom. It reminds me awfully of a very famous photograph from the early part of the uh, 19th century by the photographer Olga Zander. And he has a photograph called Three, young, three Farmers uh, Going to a Dance. Well, here we have three, surely three young farmers uh, preparing themselves for the dance within. Nothing unconventional, you might think about the photograph there, but what strikes me 
is the, the surroundings and it's the bareness of it. This is the bathroom. This is the men's toilet of the place. It's the one cold tap there. It's the toilet hiding in the background. It's the single uh, empty bulb. It's the, it's the scrawls on the falling away plaster that tells you that even within this ballroom of promise and hope, that the reality is a cold and, and a trembling sort of a place as these young lads get ready for whatever is within, within the ballroom of promise. And the next photograph I think will show us something of the promise. Well, if promise it is, the title here on this, I hope you can see it, I can't see it fully there, is Mineral Bar. And I, what is characterized by here is, I suppose, the ennui of, of, of these people. The, 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 absence, the, the, the lust, the absence of, of energy. The only woman, of course, uh, who's part of the audience um, is, is looking away from the young men. Thanks very much, thank you. And um, the, the, the absence of any vim or vigor of, of, of our dance is what strikes me here. The, 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 the mineral bar point is, is of some interest because as partly as a, a result of the same sort of prohibitions that I spoke of in the past, one didn't have any drink available. And, 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 and the, the, the dangers of drink were uh, preeminent in the, in the minds of the clergy in particular. And that 1935 legislation that was brought in against dancing was because of fears that young people were having too good a time, the arrival of the car, the motor car and the, uh, the amount of drink meant that sex was happening. Uh, so mineral bars, even as late as, as 1982, only mineral bars could be found at these dance halls. And if we move on to the next image, this one is, is very par like in its, I find it extremely unsettling. It's difficult to tell what's going on. For me, and I think for many viewers, it, it, we're, just, we're just unclear about the, the proportions, for example, of this young man, the size of him compared to this other young person beside him, whether it's male or female, again, I'm not sure. And that's an ambiguity that comes up recently and uh, frequently. The selection of young women, if women they are, yes, they are women, yes, surely, uh, that are standing up on the left-hand side. And what is the background? My initial image was, was, I thought, of course, that this was the outside of an airplane, but it's not an airplane. We know that's within a ballroom. What is going on? He makes us unsettled, and I think our unsettledness is, is, is akin to the unsettledness of the people who are there. The, 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 the person on the left-hand side looking out anxiously at the camera, the other young girls looking anxiously at him. What there isn't here is any suggestion of pleasure, of enjoyment, of ease. Um, what it does also depict is one thing too, it's about, the, about the, the, the topography, you might say, of the ballroom and the way that it operated is that the women stood around the periphery. There were seats there which they either sat upon or they stood about and the men walked around examining them until they came across one who, would they, who they would dare ask to dance, to be accepted or to be refused as the case may be. Thanks very much. And this I find almost the most unsettling of them all, a very peculiar photograph that reminds me in the, in, in the solitude, in, in the misery of it, of uh, Edward Hopper's uh, Nighthawks, perhaps. There are so many sad, grey, unhappy things going on there. Just look at the, the lines of sight, of course, that draws our, our eyes somewhere into a future, but it's a future that's, that's blocked off suddenly by that wall there as if it's a, a metaphor for the loss of hope and for the paralysis that seems to be the nature of, of these photographs and of the society that's being depicted. Paralysis in a world that should be dancing, that should all be about excitement and energy and that. And even within the photograph itself, that anxious man looking out, uh, what, looking at us and fearful, it seems to me, thin, narrow, unhappy, and the woman on the right-hand side who seems to be almost headless. What is happening there? And you could read this for, and I don't think that you're going to find too much happiness or too much satisfaction within it. So that's something of the interior of the, of the ballrooms um, of romance of Ireland as depicted very nicely. One, qu one, one question I think that's worth addressing is that one might ask, is this, is this true of Ireland? Is that what these places were like? And I can, I can attest to the fact that this is the truth. This is not the whole truth. And there were other moments, of course, that were, that were different from this, but everything here depicts precisely and perfectly the, the grey atmosphere of, the, of, of, the, of rural Ireland uh, at the time. Uh, abandonment. Well, I am just going to read you something. 
Rachel can just flash this series of photographs on the screen as I read one bit. Ruins um, seem to appear everywhere in the Irish landscape, but these comically, but also melancholic images of new ruins of metal rather than ancient stone or pillars, walls, and roofs of burnt out big houses um, destroyed in the early 20th century. Um, it, during his early visits to Ireland, Parr drove around the country in his own low cost British Morris Minor and began to notice abandoned models of the same kind of car dumped in the bogs since there were no official dumps for vehicles in Ireland, apparently, I'm told. He reports that local people who knew of his growing interest um, informed him of the lo locations of these Morris miners and even said that the photo book he created, he created of those shoots were a communal effort. Weird, surreal, but wonderful. All right. The next section we organized is called From Cabin to Bungalow to Suburbia. When Parr began photographing in Ireland, thatched tenant cabins, iconic motifs for a century of artists in Ireland were being replaced in response to demands for warm sanitary and more private homes. Here's a painting of these scenic but damp cabins with whitewashed stone walls, dirt or stone floors, and outdoor plumbing. Paint, paintings by the major artist, Paul Henry, you see one of his before you, um, were used by Ireland's tourist board to transmit idealized nostalgic images to tourists in the 20th century. But then in 1971, the publication of Bungalow Bliss offered low cost standard designs for those seeking to construct a modern house qualifying for grants. And its author claimed that those scenic thatched cabins were unfit even for animals. So by the late 1970s, when Parr came to Ireland, more than 10,000 bungalows were being built each year. The arrival of this new vernacular architecture appalled traditionalists, but met pressing practical needs in rural Ireland. Rarely do Parr's photos offer nostalgic images of a disappearing folk architecture. More frequently and with considerable wit, as you'll see, they reflect forces of change within a rural and newly suburban society intent on escaping its poverty-ridden past. Um, here we have a double image. The par photograph is on the left, and I'll tell you about the dresser in a minute. Um, this is one kind of melancholy photo of loss that I think par offers us. Without a lot of humor, the interior of this tenant cabinet signals the dispersal of its former inhabitants through immigration or most likely by a move into a modern bungalow, perhaps up the hill, perhaps next door. The familiar Irish dresser now dilapidated is filled with bits of pottery while the kettle, bread box, rags and bits of hanging clothing evoke details of a life now abandoned. The photo of a real dresser we exhibited in an earlier Irish Macmillan exhibit, exhibition, Rural Irish Interiors, the inside story, suggest the inhabitants' pride and display of their modest commodities and is used to figure the contrast with the dilapidated piece in Parr's photo. All right, this um, bungalow named High Chaparral is displayed along with a steer skull on its gate. The, uh, you see the name of the, the home, High Chapel. And it illustrates the change from inward looking and traditional vernacular architecture of a thatched ca uh, cabin to a wildly literal attempt to absorb the romance of the American West into Ireland's rural West. 
Parr's photo situates the bungalow within the rectangle created by entrance, entrance posts and cross beams of an American wooden fence, not a traditional stone wall using local materials, a frame within a frame. With these fences, the horn uh, bull skull over the driveway entrance and the house name borrowed from an American TV series, Hi Chaparral ran about 10 years before the photo, Parr makes his comic point. If you, don't, if you can't or don't immigrate, immigrate to the US, you could at least create an image of it at home in Mayo. The next one, um, this 1983 image juxtaposes a new sort of rural architecture with traditional methods of construction a half-built and uncharacteristically large house in the West is being erected by a worker who with his donkey cart, with his donkey and cart resembles the British photographer John Hines' tourist postcards of a quaintly innocent and pre-modern Ireland. 32 million of Heinz postcards were printed in 1966 alone, and they're still around. And Parr has cited Hahn as an influence on his own work, particularly inspiring his turn to color. So in 1983, the ambitious drive into modernity is still serviced by traditional workers. We're a little, we're, I'm taking a long time. I'm just gonna tell you one thing about this suburban picture. I want you to notice in this suburban development outside of Dublin, the sweeping lawns, British seeming, and the signage, Torquay Wood and Westminster Lawns. I mean, these are names straight out of Britain. There's a new middle class emerging and what are they building? British modeled houses. Westminster Lawn, Turkey Wood is um, in, uh, isn't it in Devon? And it's called the Riviera of England. Okay, next, Marjorie. So this section is called Buying Good Times. And as, as Vera mentioned in the introduction, um, these decades saw a number of pretty high profile changes in Ireland, um, those concerning divorce, same-sex marriage, abortion, the peace accord. But Parr was also very interested in documenting um, something else, how the textures of everyday life were changing. Uh, and in this section, um, he's again focusing on how people spent their leisure time. Uh, this, this is a photo taken at Butlins Holiday Camp in County Neath. Um, Butlins was a, a leisure resort chain. It came to Ireland from the UK in 1948 and um, offered solid, uh, summer holiday sites, um, which had things like a ballroom and an indoor water park, fair rides and chalets that working class families could stay in. Over time, as cheap package holidays to Europe and perhaps warmer places, became accessible, the camps declined in popularity. Uh, interestingly, since 2000, this one has been a direct provision center, which is a controversial accommodation system for people seeking asylum. Uh, this photo, ooh, can you go back one, for one second, Rachel? Thank you. Uh, this photo also indicates Parr's interest in framing. So in the image, um, we have these headless bodies of the swimmers that are framed by rectangular panes of glass and they seem eerily suspended above the seated figures. Okay. Uh, while many of Parr's black and white photographs of leisure activities featured mostly men, the later color photog photography increasingly documents the participation and activities of women as well. And in this image, the little girl's pink plastic pony and cart uh, suggest to me new layers of commodification su surrounding a traditional le leisure activity going to the races. Uh, but they also suggest, I think, a new generation taking up that traditional activity. Uh, and it forms an interesting contrast to the earlier photo that I described of as um, the, one, the one of racing. 
The image also illustrates that in many of the color photographs, Parr zooms in very closely, cropping the frame in surprising ways. So that in this one, uh, we only see the dad's hair and the little girl's mouth. Uh, and color in general seemed to coincide with Parr developing a more pointed and critical take on various aspects of Irish culture, uh, including consumerism. Uh, as Ireland became more outward looking, prosperous and cosmopolitan, many people began to embrace a new foodie culture. Potatoes, here we see potatoes, corned beef and cabbage, which invoke traditional Irish food, but are now served up with a more artfully arranged presentation uh, and suggest a more self-conscious production and marketing of Irish tradition for other people to consume. And if we could go to the next one, this is a very artfully concocted flat white with the, the little heart uh, in the foam, uh, has replaced traditional Irish beverages uh, like tea. Okay, now this section is related to buying good times, but instead it's buying good stuff. So we're still thinking about consumerism. Um, while most of the black and white photos document rural people and rural life, these color ones um, increasingly document urban life uh, and the increasing proliferation of new consumer products and services. Uh, this one juxtaposes uh, the declining influence of Catholicism embodied in the carefully landscaped grotto for the Virgin Mary with the rise of consumerism illustrated by the signs advertising takeaway food. Uh, it's, I also find it funny um, because I think the power line extending up above the grotto and slightly to the left suggests that the Blessed Virgin has a, some kind of direct line uh, to heaven. And I think it's very interesting to think about this image in, as a kind of contrast to the earlier black and white images of the Pope's visit. Okay, next one. Uh, this is this one. I also think is um, has an element of humor. Uh, it was taken a year after this South Dublin shopping center opened in 1985, and it introduced uh, Europe's first drive-through restaurant. It's almost certainly a McDonald's. I feel it shows a confused consumer trying to figure out how to order through the speaker. Uh, it also suggests, I think, not just consumerism and new kinds of services and goods, but also uh, the Americanization of daily life to some extent. Next one. This image, I think, references traditional Irish landscape photography. Uh, the national, natural landscape here, uh, suggested by the trees and the sky on the right, is in the process of being eclipsed by the urban landscape. As in the previous uh, image, I think the human figure interacts somewhat awkwardly with this new, this new urban world. He's, his, his, the motion of his body seems somewhat awkward uh, to me. Next one. Uh, and this is, I think, one of Parr's most sharply ironic images. He's focusing on a tourist buying good stuff, in this case, Irish crystal, which would be a kind of iconic Irish um, product. And it's at the world's first duty-free shop, which opened in Shannon Airport in 1947. The juxtaposition of the elegant crystal with the shopper's bent and burdened body, again, a kind of bodily awkwardness, uh, I think suggests a critical view of modern consumerism. Okay, tourism in the North. In these photographs taken in the decades after the 1998 peace agreement established conditions for Irish peace, Parr frames the history of Northern Ireland as spectacle, as a, as a new object of the gaze of locals and visitors. The images suggest how Belfast, a city torn by decades of political and sectarian violence killing thousands, has now in the 21st century reinvented itself as a tourist site. 
The first picture, the one you see before you, is a bus, bus tour of a parliament building at Stormont. Now, Parle's, Parr's perspective on Belfast Governmental Center focuses on its role as an object of this tourist gaze. The tour takes viewers past Northern Ireland's parliament buildings at Stormont and then along the predominantly loyalist Shankill Road and the Republican Falls Road, sectarian identified areas made famous by their murals and barricades erected there by residents during the Troubles. Framed by the bus window and illuminated by a combination of flash and available light, this carefully coiffed tourist gazes at the neoclassical building at Stormont, which was opened by Britain's Prince of Wales in 1932, and the unionist-dominated parliament had long governed without consensus, and it was regarded as incorrigibly sectarian. Its rule was suspended in 1972, the year of Bloody Sunday, and it reopened as a power sharing assembly when the Good Friday Agreement um, came into being. The next image um, illustrates how murals of the Troubles era have become major tourist icons. And it now focuses on Northern Ireland's political divide from the Republican perspective. Visitors, alternatively moved, perhaps curious or bored, stand before a mural celebrating Bobby Sands, who was famously elected a member of the Parliament, of British Parliament, and underwent a fatal hunger strike while demanding the restoration of special category status, political rather than cr uh, criminal for Republican prisoners. Parr's photograph focuses characteristically as much on the respectable middle-class sightseers in the act of looking as on the nationalist mar uh, martyr celebrated in the mural. Again, a memento of political violence, the mural has become an object of the tourist gaze. Sandy Rowe Bonfire, is, this is the first of my two final images about Belfast, and it this one depicts the yearly July 11th Loyalist bonfires uh, commemorating the victory of Protestant King William of Orange over the Catholic King James II at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, a triumph that secured Protestant supremacy in Ireland. Notice how Parr photographs these bonfires as spectacle, as an entertainment for visitors staying at the approved tourist hotel, four star, the Holiday Inn to contemplate and enjoy as part of their vacations. And the next image about 21st century Belfast, spectators at the Orange Parade marks the annual triumph of July 12th Unionist parades through Northern Irish Protestant neighborhoods and more provocatively on occasion through Catholic areas. In this image of decked, uh, decked out onlookers posing at the parade, Parr yet again invites his audience to view politics as spectacle. These somewhat grotesque enthusiasts, enthusiasts cheering a historic 17th century Protestant triumph wear pants in the colors of the British Union Jack and shirts depicting the victorious King Billy on his white horse. Okay. So we called this section playing with portraiture uh, because Parr's portraits are often enigmatic in some way. Uh, they challenge the norms or expectations associated with traditional uh, portraiture his use of color film and his work with flash. Uh, and as you see here, the determination to get in close also reveals a level of visual detail that was often um, concealed by the more atmospheric effects of the black and white images. In this one, the man's complexion and wool cap suggests the conditions of Irish agricultural work and the iconic figure of the Irish countryman. His eyes, 
central to the viewer's expectation in traditional portraiture are hidden by his cap, while the ear uh, gestures arrestingly out of the frame. So it's a kind of iconic or semi-iconic image of Irish tradition or a traditional way of life, but it's um, organized in a kind of startling manner. Okay. Uh, the curved lines of this elegantly dressed spectator's hat and blouse create a very striking composition in this one. Uh, but then there's that fly occupying the center of the image and comically undermining the subject's careful self-presentation uh, at the racetrack. The close-up establishes a color pattern via the similar colors in the hat and dress, but it also picks up on the varying textured surfaces of the woman's skin, dress, and hat. So it's both funny and I think highly stylized and almost abstract uh, in its composition. In contrast to Parr's photos, earlier photos mostly, exploring the act of looking at a shared subject, in this image, each strongly characterized female figure gazes in a different direction through eyes partly or wholly obscured by sunglasses, shadow, or the angle of vision. The facial expressions of the three central figures viewed in profile, the patterns on their dress for a leisure event, and even the clouds moving across the sky suggest Parr's use of color to capture a visual detail. And this final section uh, is called Innovation. And for me, this photo sums up a lot of Parr's Irish work. Originally, a traditional pony cart was part of Irish rural life, the kind of thing that we might have seen in some of the early black and white photos. By 2016, it has become something that's used to transport tourists when they come to the Aran Islands. And the Aran Islands, of course, are those iconic islands off the west coast of Ireland that have long been associated with traditional Irish culture and with Irish speaking. Uh, this tourism is part of the explosion of consumerism and consumer culture that Parr documents in the later color work. In the background, you can see the sleek figure of the modern ferry that brings people to the mainland, from the mainland uh, to the islands. So the tradition represented by the West of Ireland has become the object of modern tourism, consumption, and spectatorship. And I also think this um, helps link the Irish section to other sections of the exhibit, which if you go to see it, you'll see um, also display Parr's interest in tourism. And then this is the last one. Um, the innovation economy in Ireland offered increased opportunities for women to enter the workforce, for women to become business owners and entrepreneurs. And I would just note here the contrast between the women in this photo and the all male space of the cattle auction uh, that was shown earlier. Um, and if I could just sum up a, some very, very brief points uh, at the end here, um, I think one of the most important features of the Irish part of the show is the change over time that he's able to document through this 40 year span. Um, I would also emphasize that although the photos are not, com not, com not posed, they read like they're very, very carefully composed um, and they really repay uh, that kind of reading for composition. Uh, they're very, very innovative in terms of framing and perspective. They often really function as meditations on the act of looking and on spectatorship, uh, both for Parr and for the viewer. And finally, there's lots of pointed commentary, but there's also lots of humor. And I really encourage everybody um, to go and experience the exhibit in person. Thank you. Well, let me thank all of you for these most stimulating interpretations of Parr's revealing photos within this larger context of Irish culture over the past five decades. And the vision 
of the Irish Studies faculty has contributed so much to the visitor's understanding of the significance of Martin Parr's work as a visual chronicle of Irish culture. So thank you all so much. Um, and I, we have, I see one um, comment here in the chat and it's from Michael Collier. Um, and he says, in the Phoenix Park photo, there is nothing Catholic in view. It could be a pagan gathering at Tara, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna murder the Irish language in this, I'm, and I apologize, um, Usenach, or, no, Joe, Joe, it's up to you. Can you, can you help me? Tara Ishnach or Kuchen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and actually, um, the same for the photo of Krona. Did I get that right? <laughs> Patrick. I'm afraid now, but no, you no need to. Crow Patrick. Okay, thank you. Well, the, the point I think that's so interesting about Parr's take on Irish Catholicism was what I said earlier, that he's always shooting these, these photos in the landscape. I mean, it's the Irish landscape that it's used always. And uh, what does that mean? I mean, the, the mass rocks, the, the, the sacred springs, um, it is totalized. I mean, you know, all, all of Ireland, not just the man-made buildings, but the landscape itself is part of that spirituality that was expressed in the Pope's visit, I think. Well, it may also uh, speak to um, the syncretistic uh, nature of Catholicism in Ireland, which is to say that many features, particularly of sort of popular devotion in Ireland, things like patterns or holy wells, those actually have their roots in pre-Christian uh, religious traditions. And then they get grafted. I mean, it's like why we have Christmas trees, right? Then they get grafted onto um, Catholic devotional uh, practices. So we might we might see some of that in the sort of slightly pagan looking um, features of those outdoor pictures. But the but the plastic bag and those hiking shoes going up Pat Crow Patrick are quite modern. Right. <laughs> I might disagree. I think if you look closely, he's very interested in making these little points about temporalities. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Nugent, you speak to being in similar places to the bars and dance spaces photographed in this series. You mentioned how these tell the story, but not quite all of it. Can you speak to what other emotion is missing from these photos? And this comes from Patrick Demenshuk. Hello, Patrick, thanks very much. Um, I guess I, I did say that this does speak the truth, that, that all of that, that was there, that glumness, that darkness, that, that anxiety, the, uh, the passage into um, sexual relations through the dance hall, uh, was, was, was one, as maybe it is nowadays still, one fraught with anxiety, but maybe fraught very particularly with, with the deep Catholic sense of, 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 of sin that made the entire business very um, uh, uh, difficult, a complex and an upsetting one. That's not to say that there wasn't a lot of exuberance involved, but some of the two things sat side by side uneasily. The exuberance might have taken place down at one particular end of the, of the, of the, uh, of the hall, um, certainly, if there were sexual relations, they were taking place out of sight entirely. Um, it, it was a moment of transition, you might say, in Ireland, in which the, the old and the new were coming together. And these dance halls were a very particular example of a moment in which the Ireland of the past, in which dance, I'm saying, was all but forbidden um, to an Ireland of the kind of exuberance that we see within the, uh, 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 within uh, the current dance dance modes were, were coming together and maybe side by side. It's hardly surprising that Martin Parr 
would have been more excited by the images of, of the past. But that's not to say that they're not just as we had, as Vera spoke about there in a few moments ago, that we didn't see the present and the past beside each other. And there it is, of course, in the fact of the Mayflower, what the anxiety, the kind of the older anxiety of the face of the people within. The search for the new and still that anxiety of the past clinging to everything. They did coincide and if Parr didn't put both of them there, it's understandable to me. Or the ballrooms, Joe, recommend the movie, The Ballroom. There is, there's, there's a movie called The Ballroom of Romance. It comes from a short story that was written by William Trevor back in about the 1970s. And it's set in the 1980s and it is still in Ireland. It's a touchstone, the very mention of the phrase ballroom of romance. Everybody knows somewhere other what it's about. And this very short movie happens to be free and it's available on YouTube at the moment. The, 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 the reproduction is a little granular, so it's a little bit old, but my goodness, it, it, it moves you and it depicts the sadness and the desperation, the despondency and the anxiety that was, that was deeply ingrained in the landscape of this bachelor riven and, and, and sexually repressed Ireland more than anything that's ever been done. The movie was made, I'd say, around about 1985 or so, and it is still heartbreaking. And I know that Vera has seen it recently. I only rediscovered it recently. Please watch it, The Ballroom of Romance, and it's there on YouTube for anybody who wants to be kind of shocked with, to get in touch with emotions of Ireland that are very hard to depict in any other medium. So if there aren't any other questions, I think we will um, thank our speakers once again um, for a wonderful evening and um, invite all of, our, all of our audience this evening to come to the exhibition. You can experience the exhibition um, in person at the McMullen Museum or um, virtually, and we are offering virtual tours of the exhibition um, on our, that you can sign up for on our website. Um, you can also visit the exhibition virtually um, on your own. So uh, one way or another, you have an opportunity to see the exhibition, um, which I hope uh, you'll try to do. And um, thank you all for being with us this evening. Um, thank our speakers especially for a wonderful, uh, wonderful presentations. And um, we look forward to seeing you all at the McMullen Museum in the future. Take good care. Bye-bye. <laughs>